Hey everybody, I'm Jody Vance. And I'm George Affleck. And it's time for... It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Unspun. Boom! Is that like a Bruce Boudreaux? Boom! Bing Crosby. Bruce Boudreaux. I get it. The hockey reference for those who, like me, who are not on top of the hockey world, but you are. You are. Your column this week is all about this, which I thought was interesting because it's about fans and Vancouver fans. And I think this is goes beyond hockey in my mind. Right, right, but exactly, and that's why I thought it was okay to write about it because I love you know seventeen years of my life were spent covering sports full time, and my entire life leading up to that, um, I wasn't allowed to touch the remote control or, or turn the channel back in the day because mm-hmm. I have an older brother who loves hockey. Um, so, anyways, I got into it, um, and again, shout out to my dad, uh, who was the head of the PE department at Britannia, who taught me all that I needed to know about how the game works, so I could always watch any game and love it and become a fan mm-hmm. of really anything. And that, and that fandom and that that want to be a part of something cool like that is why I love sports as much as I do. And um, my column this week is about being, you know. We got a clean slate here with the firing of Travis Green and yeah. Jim Benning and the and the the, uh, the raising up to the next level of Stan Smeal. I mean, come on, guys. Anybody who's a hockey fan in this town or in this province should be like, steamers in charge, man. Let's pay attention. L- literally um, grew up with him. <laughs> literally how, grew up with that's him. That's how long he's been around. That's how. And he's always been this quality human, this quality player, this incredible leader. And he's been behind the scenes with the hockey club for – decades like he just mm-hmm. yeah so yeah. i boost brujo saucy peppery he might mm-hmm. drop some f-bombs at press conferences live you never know um it's gonna be i know how it feels <laughs> well, like, column, we'll talk about that bs columns? cup of coffee later but uh. oh yeah i want to hear that we're gonna get yeah. an, uh, an e for sure on this <laughs> but mostly my column is about how i would like this to be hopefully my middle is about um a clean slate for fans i mean Vancouver hockey fans have built a reputation since 1994, since the riots after 1994. You know, games happen at the Coliseum and somehow a riot happens on Robson Street. I didn't, couldn't figure that one out either. Um, <laughs> but, and then what we saw in 2011, and just, I think they're, the majority of fans are awesome. I love them. I love, you are me, we are all Canucks. But there are some fans out there that have just gone to the next level vitriolic uh, online posting and 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 throwing their jersey on the ice i mean that's happened in other rinks before but uh, and i explained this in my column uh three fans did that in toronto a number of years ago i think it was 2015 mm-hmm. they got banned from all mlse buildings for a what? year they got yep they got picked they got tossed obviously from the building for doing it and then they got charged by the police they had to pay a ticket because I guess throwing a jersey is is equivalent to like stamping on a, a in your national flag or something. Is that is that how dare you? It's like the it, ultimate well, in insults. Disrespectful for sure. Right. It's disrespectful, and and the team. I mean, I don't know that all the fans realize that. Well, read my column. The, yeah, having been around hockey clubs as much as I have in in my years of covering hockey, uh, the team hears you. The mm-hmm. team sees you. The families and friends of the team and everybody who works there here in CU, uh, and they don't—they don't deserve the vitriol. They are, mm-hmm. trust me, even though they're making millions of dollars. Believe me, they're trying their best every single yeah. day. <laughs> Come yeah. on. Anyways, read about it and see what you think. It's interesting though that the reaction to my column is some people are like, "Hell yes." And other people are like, da, 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 da. and I'm like, well, to the latter, I'm like, well, I guess I see which column you fit into. Oh my God. Oh, it's, yeah. you know, but fans in general, I mean, I don't know what it's about. I remember the white flag thing, the white or the white. The, yeah, that, Roger that was Nielsen. Sort of, and that was a positive, right? It was a kind of a, a mocking thing. He that, was like, I give up. I give up. To the referees. To the referees. And that yeah. became a, a thing that now the Canucks, oh, I think other teams do it now too, but it became the, the Canucks big thing. They started giving out these things, but it seemed it like it was statue. a negative, but it was a positive, right? It was like, uh, it's not like throwing your jersey on the floor, but I, you know, fans in general, even in music, we're, we're renowned in this city for being terrible fans. 
Uh, and I can remember my experience with REM when I was at a concert there and he was trying to get, uh, Michael Stipe was trying to get people to be quiet so he could sing this really soulful song. And of course, they, they couldn't be quiet. They're like, woo, every time he was like, okay, everybody's quiet. Okay. And, he was, and then somebody or two or three people would say, oh, this is my opportunity to really scream something. And he's like, finally, he said, you know what? I'm not going to sing this song. But also, really, I think that's a lot to ask, of, uh, you know, 5,000, 20,000, 30,000 people, whatever it was in any stadium, but certainly in Vancouver, where we are renowned for being uh, energetic. <laughs> but here's the thing, George, and, and I'm glad you bring up the concert equivalent so it doesn't sound like I'm just being hard on, on, fans that are frustrated yeah. is there is that piece of the puzzle that is missed. Like if you go to a Springsteen concert and you go on that ride with him and he is, you're in the palm of his hand, the entire show, you're a part of it. Mm -hmm. You feel like a part of it. If you're the cat calling individual, everybody at a Spring Springsteen show would turn to you and you would very quickly be quiet. You know, it's just like, be a part of the experience, get on board. I, you know, been been in other barns during playoffs and nobody's quiet for a second nobody needs pump up music to get people cheering in vancouver it's like hello hello Game right four, round one guys Anybody but then i go to thing uh, but then i go to some shows and people are like standing up and giving standing ovations so easily here i don't understand i'm like there's that too i don't i don't, I I don't think you know, that was worth it anyway. <laughs> but okay we're standing up are we uh, i don't the, yeah. the fans in the city i think are are and, and this is not a, a, don't 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 add us like for being mean about it i think we're a curious city uh in how we behave and i'm not sure where that comes from where where it stems from uh, because it's certainly, yeah, when you experience it in other cities, it's not the same thing. And and although it's, it's so funny, if you've traveled, and I lived in Europe and lived in Denmark, and fans and the way people behave in audience, you know, in Europe where they all start clapping in sync, you know, they, they clap, then they yeah. start, they're clapping in sync, you're like, clapping in sync, okay, that's what we do here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And then there's like the European soccer, those fans, of course, which hooligans. Been a real hooligans, but they really, the movement, you know, for the soccer football industry uh, in, in Europe for, for almost a generation now has been to move it to being more family friendly, to get away from that hooligan uh, behavior. Um, Did they just block all the windows for the real hooligans so they couldn't look in? <laughs> Are you referring to Surrey? See where I'm going with that, George? <laughs> nice segue. Nice segue. Yeah, Wait, I know can this you is explain okay. that? Well, you know, the Surrey uh, has um, uh, Surrey Council, very, very uh, uh, interesting days in Surrey. But so this was the latest council meeting. There's some people that have basically been banned from attending council meetings, which I've never heard of this before happening. There, there are we had a couple of people that uh, because they had made they had actually had police related issues. They were not allowed to come into the city hall building in Vancouver, but that was literally, they had been charged with various right. things That's against I think. certain politicians. But in this case, it was just, they didn't, you know, Doug McCallum and the majority there decided they didn't like these people for whatever reason. They were probably, they were probably being a bit, maybe Canuck fans throwing their jerseys. I'm not sure they were throwing jerseys, but you know, okay. So now, but in Surrey, if you go to their council chambers, they have like a big window bank and you can actually, if they can get into 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 the, the building you can still see the council meetings through these windows whereas in vancouver you can't really see into the chamber right. so these people were sitting and, and just sitting outside the chamber looking and, and being i guess obstructive to a certain degree and so they blacked out the windows so you, they can't see in now uh it's just so it's kind of anti-democratic you know yeah, uh, I don't. It's uh, concerning, and I think it's a, it's something. Surrey, I think you know, uh, is this year has been very interesting. We're going into an election year, and uh, now they don't have a budget. I mean, we'll get let's get into Vancouver's budget in a minute, but Surrey doesn't even have a budget yet. Like, and yeah, and but last gets, week, last week on this sh sh very show on this yes. program, you pointed out that the city of Vancouver doesn't have to have their no. budget. By yeah, by yeah, that's right. You have till May basically to get a budget together. Any, it's you know, it's you, your year end starts earlier, but or your year starts earlier, but you don't have to have a budget. Uh, but usually, you'll explain that uh, publicly. Yeah. What's happening in Surrey? What's interesting is uh, the people who are not on uh, Doug McCallum's team are saying this is an outrage. You know, how could we not have a budget? Uh, and it is a good question. Generally, in an election year, when you after the election, I would say it's a good chance, especially in the case of Vancouver. And that was my point last time was that it was a new council. They didn't need to rush into the budget they were presented was basically right. the budget the previous council 
had put right. together. So, hey, take a step back and take your time and wait till, you know, February, March, April and, and put a budget that really do reflects right. you as a new council. They didn't do that. They just kind of approved the budget that was presented that we created when I was there, which I didn't like. Um, I didn't like it to start with and I certainly didn't <laughs> like how it ended and I don't like a new one. But so they so this so but, you know, I just know I, I would be very, very surprised if these councillors who are not on the Doug McCallum team weren't informed by staff that the budget was behind and that there is a process or a schedule that exists that they would be informed of in, in, in camera uh, meetings. They abs- right. There's no way that they, that, uh, unless, unless Doug McCallum has complete control of all staff, but finance are required to report to the council about the process. And there is always, uh, you know, meetings that you have to kind of discuss uh, you know, if you have questions, you want to kind of hash things out and you're trying to figure out the budget and you have meetings, you have one-on-one meetings with financial people, the finance team, if you want, at least, you know, you can, and some cities are a bit harder on that. I know Vancouver's gotten tough on that with counselors that they don't want the meeting one-on-one with staff, which is a, dis- you know, not good because you, you, you know, you want to have these conversations that you have questions that sometimes are, may seem dumb to somebody else. You just want to have, Hey, uh, you know, director of finance, uh, here's a question I don't want to ask publicly. Um, yeah. Uh, cause you know, these budgets are complicated. Um, so right. I, 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 so I, I think can't believe that they discourage that, right. Just frankly, from an yeah. outsider's perspective, not yeah. being able to have that collaborative vibe to something as complex as planning for a city that really is, this is, that's like saying the board members in the huge corporation are not allowed to discuss things unless they're sitting at a certain table with their, yeah. with a certain protocol around it. That to me is counterintuitive to, to getting the details right. And that's what, you know, we can all see the broad strokes, but it's the details that really impact the community, I think. 100%. Hold on. I got to get my charger because my thing is dying. Sorry. Okay. Right I love this. Okay. So in between, in between you go you go do that. Okay, I love right it. Back. This has totally happened to me. That happened to me while I was doing the UBCM with Rick Mercer. Um, I had to pause and run around my computer like this uh, and just and plug it in. It's it's just so crazy. So we're going to get to the city of Vancouver uh, budget stuff in particular, but mostly while while George is away because he already knows this is the conversation uh, that he and I had after we re- we received press releases at exactly the same time. George, at exactly the same time, we got press releases from the city of Vancouver, as well yes. as the campaign for uh, current mayor Kennedy Stewart. Like yes. it's literally exactly the same time can you explain that to me oh my god it was and you know of course one of the press releases was about the budget and saying how the npa had voted against uh, the police budget because and they are all talking about crime and that they wanted more police on the beat and blah 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 and there they go and vote against the the, the police budget you know like, oh my god this they envisioned this to me all the time because you vote against the budget you can't vote against you can kind of vote against parts of it maybe but generally you, you know you vote against the, the budget as a whole or you for or against, please don't abstain, which we see a lot of in Vancouver these days. Um, that's not a vote anyway. That's that's just not doing your job. Um, yeah. So, so these, these I mean, it's just, and the fact that they came up for the mayor's office and the team Kennedy Stewart or whatever it's called clearly shows that there is, you know, a relationship. The same between, person clicking yeah. on the button that hits yeah. send. Come on. We are, we're born on a day. It was not yesterday. I mean, <laughs> I, I find it, I find that really Poor optics. Like at least, yeah. at least two minutes apart. <laughs> like it was literally the same time set. It came in at the exact same time, and I don't think that's coincidence. I think no, that's, and it's uh, like yeah. I don't know what they expect. And I was, you know, I mean, what are media going to do with that? I mean, they might pull quotes from it, I guess, but I don't know. Even you know, yeah, it's a bit. It's hard not to be cynical about that. Uh, as a resident and as a journalist, probably I think it would be the same way. You sort of put your your spidey senses on, and you go, "Okay, we don't want to get played here." But no. you know, it's it's an election year, and uh, it's mud. They're going to throw it against the wall and see what sticks. And they're going to see more and more of that. And and uh, Dan Fermano's article in the Sun, to, you know, today I think it was was about you know this budget's going to be the Vancouver budget is going to flow through the next 10, 11 months till the election time. It's, it's the, it will be the defining document. And, you know, I was on, uh, I was hosting yesterday for filling in for jazz Joe hall. And the first half an hour of the show was, I pulled all the clips from all these, well, I didn't, you know, but you know, Ryan did, but we, still, we, 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 yeah. uh, Ryan I, Lee did, Hall. I, I, yeah, Lee Hall, who's the uh, producer there. And, uh, 
you know, I did a bridge between each one of them, uh, each, you know, Adrian Carr and this and that, you know, and then you can basically, you know, and John Cooper, who's with the MPA and, you know, they're all trying to find a position. What was interesting, though, I thought, well, there were, I didn't hear anything from Mark Marison, who's running for mayor. Who else is running? Ken Sims running for mayor. Uh, John was the only one really out there talking about the budget in front of who it. wants to be yeah. the mayor next time. And I, I'm thinking this is the $1.7 billion budget. $1.7 billion. Billion. Billion dollars. Uh, and that's just the operating budget. There's also a capital budget, which is a few hundred million. Uh, so, you know, it's... And then Adrian Carr was talking about how, you know, there was this, and it was Christine Boyle. And this is the question about what is a promise in politics? So, you know, is a, poli- is a promise only when you're running for office and you make a promise? Or is something that you vote on a promise and, and, and say, we're going to do this within your time? And so Adrian Carr was saying, no, this was, we, there was a motion that they unanimously supported that the budget would only be a 5% increase. And it turned out to be 6.7 or, you know, almost 7% increase. Uh, and so people are saying you broke your promise. So she's saying no, a, a motion is not a promise. Christine Boyle is saying kind of yes, we broke our promise, but we also had other motions that other things which we've talked about a lot. The two hundred motions that this council, this two hundred directions that this council in Vancouver has given staff to go. Hey, that costs money. And so Christine Boyle's point is good. It's solid in that yeah, we because we can't do all the other things that we promised even though Adrian Carr says those aren't promises uh, to do. And so it's, it's it's a dilemma that they put themselves in. And that's kind of what I always was, have been saying is you can't do all these things within the financial restrictions that you have in a budget. So you have to be responsible and go, what can we achieve? And so don't throw a bunch of stuff on the floor and of ideas that you have when you think, when you know, and you should know that it's going to cost money, no matter what it is, unless it's a motion to not spend money, which ironically was that one motion that they've done in three years to cap at 5%, which, by the way, is still way above the rate of inflation. Way and above. Still one of the biggest budgets ever. It is the budget's biggest and over, budget. Year over year, it's collectively an incredible increase for the, the homeowner in, in an already affordability crunched city. Yes. Uh, it is just, it is beyond, it's beyond anybody's uh understanding i for for me anyways i I live in vancouver i born and raised in vancouver i am not a wealthy individual i've watched the city grow into something that is unbelievably unaffordable for so many and here we sit staring down another increase for no payoff because over the last five years i I would argue that this city has spiraled down in ways i I can't even i can't like i can't articulated enough. I feel like I'm speaking to this ad nauseum on this podcast. Like, I don't care who's in charge. This is not a slag against whoever's in that office, no. but whomever has been in that office over these years is failing because the yes. city is is putting up it's you know fancy buildings while the roads are crumbling. Our garbage isn't being picked up, but we have chandeliers that spin under oh. Uh, uh, you know, okay. like, and the optics of that. No, but that's for me. That's no, for I me, know, right? I the know. optics of that and, for me are hundred percent flawed. We need, literally we need a in line your face item every day. Budget. Yes. yes, a line item budget that explains how this and, is allowed sparkly, fresh new things while our, you know yes. the sewage is flowing into the ocean still. Uh, the garbage isn't being picked up. There's potholes on every street. There's mm-hmm. graffiti everywhere. There aren't enough garbage cans. The, the park is getting a, a whatever, $25 million bathroom. I'm exaggerating, but come on. Like, there aren't enough bathrooms. And, and, don't, people. and peeing don't, in the lanes. And don't give me that, as I've said before, and I won't use the words, so we'll try to keep our E out of this, BS cup of coffee. Because, hey, it's only a, you know, only a cup of coffee. $137 you, more. Yeah, well, every year, 137 100 bucks, 100 bucks, 100 bucks. I don't care how rich you are or how poor you it, it, it still impacts the, you know, your your pocketbook is people, which I hate that term, but it's like a hundred bucks and a hundred bucks. Going to London, bucks you better year. be ready. For it. I don't know. Governor, <laughs> pocketbook. Uh, governor, my pocketbook uh, uh, is right here. Hold on yes. a moment. Yes. But then, you know, you, you're looking at, the, they're predicting this next year for the average family, a basket of goods, of food, the basic necessities of life are going to go up by $900 in the next year. Yeah. $900 more for our, to live. Our, and, and then Just what plus, you were buying before. Yeah. So you add another hundred bucks. So if you're a family income is a hundred thousand dollars, which may sound like a lot of money, but your cost of survival is gone up by a thousand dollars. And that's if you have a hundred thousand dollar family income, that's, that's, that's a big chunk of your, 
that's a hundred thousand gross potentially. That's not even bef that's you know before taxes, and so you you have to take this very very seriously. Every hundred bucks here, and a hundred bucks there, and a hundred bucks there, or ten bucks here, twenty bucks there, thirty bucks there. This adds up, and I don't understand anybody who does. You can use that argument that this is only a cup of coffee. Hey, calm down, everybody. No, that's not how it works. And it, you know, you look at the percentage, and that's what you need to focus on. Why do we need to raise it up five, six, seven percent in last year? Seven percent the year before, six percent. This council in Vancouver and others aren't doing it. Why is Vancouver? going up so much more. And then, of course, I heard Adrian Carr saying, well, you know, we are a center for so many different things. And, you know, it's more expensive to be in Vancouver because we have stadiums and we have this and we have that and people come here and therefore we have more crime and because of I mean, the blah, blah, blah. Uh, it doesn't justify the increase. Yes. Well, no, and that's, it doesn't. No. Yeah. Yes. Talk about I mean, crime because it's everywhere now or it feels like it is for sure. And I know that Amanda I'm, is not comfortable walking out of our door in Yale Town anymore. I was just going to say that. I'm the same. I'm I'm in Kitsilano, and I'm not walking around here by myself at night. I'm, I never and, thought. And by the way, I night never thought that would happen in our, in our our lives. Like that. And night see starts that. at four thirty. By the way, yeah, this time of year, and we lock our doors while we're in our house. I've written about that because somebody has literally opened my front door, grabbed my purse, and closed it and left. We hear about pl places in and around Metro Vancouver. This is obviously not just a Vancouver problem, but it is an ever growing problem, uh, crime 100%. in the city. And with every increase in our taxes in Vancouver, where more people come, where we have a stadium, where there's more crime, blah, blah, blah. It's not getting better because mm -hmm. there's two, there are 200 motions on the table that need to be paid for. So there's not enough money for police. Mm -hmm. The policing, you know, the, the, the arguments between the city and the VPD and the acrimony between the two and what it costs to, to take care of that is significant. Last week, we we're talking about fire, we can go to the provincial level, maybe the mayor of Vancouver, maybe actually, John Horgan, you, you may or may not have seen the tweet, probably you did, did. Um, with uh, Katrine Conroy getting yeah. um, knocked to the ground. I don't know the details around it. He, he tweeted about how she was, you know, mm -hmm. it's assault. Let's call it what it is. It, she was it's, assaulted on her way yeah. leaving the legislature. And, and my first thought was, well, the premier is tweeting about it, so that sounds political. She's an NDP. Maybe it's a disgruntled mm -hmm. somebody, but maybe it's just random because that's what's happening everywhere. There are random attacks happening all over British Columbia, and it's terrifying. We need yeah. more support for those who fight crime and, uh, you know, a collaborative um, focus on on addressing it. I don't even know if there's a fix. We haven't even got to the you know, the opioid death numbers for the last month are 6.5 6 human beings. I, I hate saying the 0.5 because you can't lose half a human. And every mm -hmm. time you lose one human, you lose an entire family. These things that we keep talking about that, that there's really no um, solution to. And yet, you know, we're having these budget talks where there are no line items that address these things specifically and and how collaborative co collaboratively our provincial government and our municipal government are working together which has been proven they can through a natural disaster henry braun mayor of abbotsford well and covid and covid and covid and, you COVID. know we a lot. we've shown how governments can work together whatever their political strike when there's a crisis but and we are in a, the opioid crisis is a perfect example where i don't know why we can't get a handle on that um it's and awful. affordability is a crisis and we there doesn't seem to be a, a comprehensive plan. Uh, the expectations and the and the and the downloading from the federals, the province, the cities, to the individuals to deal with this, uh, and the nonprofits or whoever. And guess what happens? Nobody can deal with it because nobody can solve this on their own. You have to work together. A national housing program, a national opioid pro program that is in partnership with the federal and the provincial and local governments um, that includes funding and systems and, you know, potentially hospitalizations that will be increased in places to put these the people that are addicted um, to opioids, which most Safe of them are, are people living Safe like they're, supply. yeah, this is, and these are, again, these aren't people on the downtown east side. The opioid crisis is not a downtown east side problem. It's a society problem related to all sorts of things. And and so we have to stop saying, I think a lot of people, and I think maybe politically can brush it off as saying, oh, well, you know, they're drug addicts. Mm, yeah. But that's not, that's no, yeah, they're addicted to drugs, case. but they're also, they are, they have a disease, their addiction, like any, like alcoholism, like anything. And we disrespect because it's drugs, not alcohol. We'll, we'll take care of people with alcohol, uh, you know, addictions more than we will with drug addictions. There's this, 
Predominantly middle-aged men in yep. suburbia. Se- 78% of those who are dying yeah. of this are, are, are men. And I believe that the number was like 34 to 59 year old men. Yep. And the majority not on the downtown east side. No, working not. class. It's, they're working, working class guys. people who have hurt their mm-hmm. back, whatever, on yep. the job. And then they yep. got the pain meds from the doctor to do it. They got addicted to the pain meds. The doctor said you can't have many more. Now they self-medicate. Safe supply is not available. Therefore, there's fentanyl. They use alone because they're embarrassed to say that they're addicted to the mm-hmm. drug. And then they die in their bedroom. And it's just, it's it's needless and it's sad. And I keep I got a shout out to Guy Felicella because every time I speak with him, who is a recovered uh, mm-hmm. user, uh, he has turned his life around in ways that are incredible. And yep. he's an advocate on trying to create the, the safe supply for those who do live in poverty and addiction and those many thousands of people who live homeless. And are, if I live homeless, I'd imagine I'd self-medicate too. That would be terrifying. Never mind, you know. You know. And, the, and the medical system is complicated for sure. If you have anybody yeah. you know, like I, you know, if you have a seniors, like a person who's a, like a, who are taking lots of different medications, it's complicated, you know, and there are different ways to do this. But if you're taking four or five different drugs or three different drugs and, and they have different expiry or dates when you have to pick them up, you know, uh, because I've dealt with this with a family member, and it's it's actually like super complicated. You're like, okay, this one is has to be renewed the th- third fifteenth. This one's the seventeenth, and you can't actually. You have to wait. You have to get that one. I have to go on the fifteenth. That one I have to go on the seventeenth. That one's the nineteenth. Things like, why can't that even be synced up? So then you right well, because it's complicated. You're not allowed to have and, them that close together because no. if you do, then it doesn't. It's not covered. Right. And then it's and like you can only get thirty days. Of course, you can only get thirty right. days prescription, and and that's and so if you're not uh, if you have challenges with you know bureaucracy and like that kind of stuff, the likelihood of you stepping off or falling off your medication is very high. And so there, that's just a minute, min, you know, microscopic bit of the problem that could be easily fixed, uh, and it's right. not being fixed. And so the, there's many about- of those. There are. I mean, I'm going to jump to the COVID fix that some people are screaming for with uh, using antigen tests. You're about to travel um, Mm -hmm. next week. You're going to work right up to the very last second. I'm going to make you work even on (laughs) Tuesday. We're going to we're going to record the best of and sort of reflect back. But you have to get tested to go on this next trip. And my parents just came back from Palm Springs. They've got a place in Palm Springs. They're in their uh, 80s. And they had to do the, the whole rigmarole of coming back into Canada and and now they're planning on their return. Hello, Governor. Pointing there you go, Governor. But they, they're going to be doing the antigen test to go south as opposed to the PCR test to come north. And we've learned a lot. <laughs> it's And the paperwork Arrived is... Can, oh, yeah. And, yeah I did it all for and, them. I did it all for them. It was quite something. Crazy. And still they got pulled over for a test at the airport. Can you believe it? Their number. Oh, really? Back. Let's pull the 84-year-olds over for to, to hang out with the, the people longer in the... <laughs> I know. Crazy, old, she, she looks like know, a troublemaker. Uh, I, I could see she that. Could, yeah, yeah, she's totally. Um, but okay, so antigen tests. What do you know about these uh, in terms yeah. of efficacy? Like, would people like, all, why don't we all use them? I know. Well, there's two things that I think are going on. One is the efficacy of them the, that you have to, from what I understand from a friend who worked at the CDC, is that they're 40%, 30 to 40% effective, or, or um, not effective, like uh, accurate. And you have to have the symptoms uh, in order to for them to be accurate at all. Uh, so if 30 to 40% is pretty high and, you know, that's not very effective. It's not a good number to base a decision on whether you can travel or whether you should, whatever. And so I think there, there's- Post, that, post that, Christmas? What are, yeah, that kind of stuff. And I think that Bonnie Henry's, that's one reason. The other reason I think they haven't pushed hard because it, it actually takes away from getting your vaccination. Like people go, well, I'm not going to get vaccinated because I'll just do this test every day. It's four, but you know, in the state, in the UK, you can they get these things for I think they're two pounds, three pounds. You can get yeah. these things at the pharmacy, but it, and, and Denmark, look at the numbers. they're free. Yeah, but and they, look, free and they suggest you do it all the time. Yeah, and their vaccination rates are, are high, which is unusual. But I think she might be thinking, I don't want to make it easy for you not to get your vaccine. I think that's where her thinking is. I think I, I think that's what's going on here in BC. It's like no, 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 no. The only solution is get vaccinated. It's not about finding out, you know. Oh, I didn't get the vaccination. So I'm just going to keep track, and then and then I'll avoid going to a place. Because guess what? If you do that, you're still going to infect people. Because the chances are, you your this little tool 
will not work and provide you with the proper right. data. So it's a it's a double header on that one, I think, uh, of why. And and so I think hey, you know what we're doing great here, BC. We're over ninety percent on adults vaccinated. You know we're good. We're doing well, and yeah. we are the most 65 open. Sixty-five year olds. Sixty-five yeah. year olds next week are going to get the the call for uh, the, the booster one. shot. Oh, yeah, I know people my age who've already got their appointments next week. So anybody Excellent. who was vaccinated six months ago should be getting their should be get, especially if you're on AstraZeneca, which I was as a you know turns out right. the worst one to have for Omicron Omicron Om, Om, Omicron 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 this is awesome. We've got a couple of bloopers in here. We should gather them together. Uh, uh, Amanda will love them. But we're, okay. we're out of time anyway. Can you hear so me? Because we'll, we'll, sometimes I lose I can, you. I can hear okay. you. Okay. I can hear you. You, might, you maybe can't see me, but I can hear you. Um, okay. I, I just want on the Omicron uh, point, the news yes. today is that uh, while it will take weeks to still figure out the sequencing and, and the impacts, right now, Pfizer has said, that two dose has some wane, but it's still effective. Get a third dose, that'll protect you in a higher level of protection. Uh, two doses does still protect from severe illness, hospitalization, and death, which is the biggest point here. Uh, secondly is early testing is showing that this particular variant is less severe than Delta. So while more exponentially right. more contagious, it is less severe. Still much more information to come on that, but I got that from Peter Hotez because I follow him on Twitter. You got to follow George on Twitter, George. Underscore. Affleck. <laughs> George <laughs> underscore Affleck. I'm at Jody Vance, Jody with a Y. Vance, George is uh, uh, going to be flying away, but between now and then going to be doing uh, a bunch of radio on CKNW, as am I. You'll find me doing mm-hmm. Mike Smith and George doing uh, the Jazz Joe Hall show. So lots of uh, time on the radio. Say goodbye, George. Bye-bye.